Are you interested in making a 12% return on money that technically isn't even yours? If so, check out this interview I did with Serena Holmes, who is a private lending specialist. Serena explains how she got into private lending, how she's been able to scale that business, what kind of due diligence she does to feel comfortable with a borrower, and so much more. Stick around until the end of the video to learn how she got started with as little as five to $10,000. Hey, what's up? Darren Voros here. My mission is to help you reduce your real estate investing education time from months to minutes. Subscribe not to miss what's coming. And now, enjoy the interview. Let's talk a little bit about private lending because I'm sure many people are going to be wondering like how you got started with it, how mm -hmm. you vet a deal, um, what you look for in a private lender. You're doing individual private lending. I know you talked about syndication as well, mm -hmm. which syndication for those of you that don't know is like a, a multiple uh, investors on one loan. Mm -hmm. um, did you, are you doing private like one-on-one -on -one stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I had a friend when I mentioned all this investing, I was starting to do um, she introduced me to a mortgage broker and he works with a number of different people. In some cases, it could be someone that, you know, has to pay off their line of credit before their mortgage can close and they might have a, a bridge loan. They may need it for their business. Like it could be all different forms. So in the beginning, I started very slowly. Like I started with three. I would have my lawyer look over the deals if there were any more than 25000 to make sure that they had equity in their home, that they owned it properly. Now that I have my real estate license, I can do some of that due diligence myself to mm -hmm. make sure that they are in fact on title and things like that. And I would just diversify my risk. So at, in the beginning, I started with 100000 to play with, I guess you could say. So I think my first loan was 45000 One was twenty, one was ten. Um, and then in year two, I laddered up, did about eight or nine of them. Same thing in the following year. This year, I think I'm sitting around 25. 25 loans. <laughs> so I really like ramped it up. Um, <laughs> you scaled yeah, your business Yeah, so I scaled quickly. it up. But again, I think, um, you know, you talked about low returns. I think for me, like the lowest I would look at using my HELOC is 12%. Mm -hmm. Obviously now what was 3% is now 6 as yeah. interest rates have gone up. Yeah. Um, at the height, I mean, I've, I've done some that are as high as 25%. So there's very much like there's good returns on it. Um, people often say, oh my gosh, that's so risky. But I'll divide it between 15 or 16 different borrowers. It's not like I'm lending all of that money to one person. So mm. the chances of everyone defaulting are slim to none, yeah. um, like touch wood. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, um, that was my approach to it, that I, I felt comfortable knowing that no one loan is more than 50000 Even in some instances, um, you know, if someone's building a project and they've got two different projects, I might do 50 in each but not a hundred together just so that that's again spread out a little bit. Mm -hmm. Some of those were through referrals. So your due diligence can be from other people that have worked with those people and have had good experiences. And I even met one person that reached out and said she had sold all of her rental properties because the returns on the cap, um, on the private lending was so much higher. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, if you could make $12,000 on every hundred, well, if you own a property worth 500,000, it's unlikely you're going to cash flow 60,000 a year on that one property. So that's maybe a different way to, to look at it. So uh, for me, like the returns have been quite strong. Yeah. And I think that, you know, you brought up so many great points there. I think the one thing that, you know, I, I am actually as a very active investor, when I find uh, I have funds available to me now, instead of going and buying another property, I'm actually moving them towards private lending. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> because of that, because I think especially in Canada right now, cash flow is so tight. Um, and I think that a lot of people think that that's how you, you know, make great cash flows. You go and buy rental properties. Yeah. But I think for, for most novice investors out there, they'll end up going and buying a property and they'll see a couple hundred dollars of cash flow a month and they'll yeah. have a hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars invested. If you can make 12% on your money, like you say, mm -hmm. that's a very different cash on cash return, if yeah. you will. And I think that's why as people get more sophisticated, they also want to scale back their time that yeah. they want to invest in real estate. So they start moving towards towards private lending, which I think is... I, I think it's important to also consider where you're at. Like for me, you know, I stopped drawing an income from my business. So I was able to have income this way. If I had a $200,000 a year job, I may not want to have that kind of income. Yeah. So that might be where you set up a business that you can loan that money into so that it's sheltered to some extent or has yeah. maybe like a lower interest rate. Um, in other cases, like you don't have that active appreciation over the long term. So again, if you want that down the road to depend on like once those loans get paid back, you're back to your principal amount. It's not like your principal amount plus whatever appreciation in the market. So mm -hmm. I think it's still important to diversify. I think there's something to be said for all of those angles. But for me, it's it's trying to do a bit of both. And 
Um, I sold my second rental property and then I dumped it into a whole bunch of private loans thinking I'll build my down payment, but interest rates are going up, prices are going down, so it makes sense to maybe buy this time next year. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, I can make that money work for me and maybe have an extra 75000 to put on the down payment just by keeping it busy in the meantime. Absolutely. So you talked about different loan amounts. Um, you talked about some relatively small numbers, 15, 25, mm-hmm. 50,000, mm-hmm. and you diversified uh, those throughout different um, private loans. Who mostly is, is borrowing that money from you? Is it act, other active real estate investors? Yeah, I, I've diversified a lot this year. So obviously I, I went from eight to 20 plus this year. Mm. Um, that's some people that are working in land development. In other cases, it's redevelopment. Sometimes it's been small business owners. Um, one of them, for example, was an $80,000 loan. It would have paid 12500 in interest for two months. They had to extend it by two months. So then I made 25000 on 80 in four months. Mm. And it was basically like to fund whatever he needed for his business during that time. Mm-hmm. So it really varies depending on who you're talking to and stuff like that. But um, I think some investors are trying to offer more equity potentially on those loans rather than like high interest monthly payments just to offset their costs and, you know, mitigate their own expenses like raising interest rates or supply costs and stuff like that. So things are changing a little bit, Mm. but I think that's why it's important just to keep your mind open, talk to as many people as possible. And that way, you know, when one loan's coming to its end, hopefully you can replace it with something else. And are you uh, with those smaller dollar amounts? Because I think this is, you know, something that I'm usually teaching my students is most people, I would say under $50,000 mm-hmm. are not going to want to secure it in a, in a mortgage position, if you will. Yeah. The legal <clears throat> costs usually are prohibitive to yeah. for the cost of that loan. Is that your experience as well? Um, so I haven't done any that are 100% secured, but usually they will list the property. So it's still noted there. I think that's still your recourse. Like for me, oftentimes I still like to get the identification for the borrowers. I like to see that the property, everything matches or on title so that if anything really happened, mm-hmm. there's still some grounds for recourse on it. Yeah. And some loans I've turned down because they didn't have as much equity as you would like them to have mm. if anything really went wrong. So that's where your lawyer might come in to look at something in more detail or you know why you might walk away from something if you're not comfortable. Yeah. With your experience now, if, if somebody's looking at getting into private lending, what would be your best piece of advice to get started? Yeah, I think it's important to talk to a lot of people. Um, definitely um, take detailed notes. That's something that I've, because I've, I've talked to a few people about it, um, I've now kind of documented everyone that I've talked to and why I like to go with them, what they can come to expect from it, things that they should do from a due diligence standpoint. And then I just tell them to trust their instincts, like set up calls with all of those people, you know, ask the right questions, like ask what is important to you to understand what the exit strategy looks like. You know, if after a year that they need the money for longer, like what happens then? Would they replace it? Do they have to extend it? I think you just want to understand all of those possible outcomes and know that you have to be comfortable knowing that money's gone for that period of time. Mm -hmm. Again, a lot of people really focus on the risk side of it. And I think out of anyone I've talked to, only a couple have decided to go ahead with it. Mm. But then once they've done it a little bit, they get comfortable and it's like, oh, what more can I do? It, you know, it becomes, a, not to say addictive, <laughs> but you're yeah. like, you see the opportunity that's out there and you just don't want to leave yourself short. So just be smart about how you go about it. Like I did start small. Um, you know, I could have probably done more up front, but I didn't want to take more than I needed. And I just wanted to like test the waters and see how things went. And then now there's probably a list of 15 to 20 different people and companies that I could talk to you about those opportunities as things become, um, you know, come to an end. Serena perfectly fits one of the four real estate investing personas that exist. She's what I would call a lender. She's someone who has money, but doesn't necessarily have the time or want to dedicate the time to being an active investor, but she loves the idea of investing in real estate to achieve her financial goals. So she uses a more passive approach. If you're like Serena and have limited time, check out my lender course that will teach you the five key strategies that you should be focusing on to help get you to your financial goals faster. I'll leave a link for that in the description below. As always, if you have questions for me, you can also leave them in the comments section. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you on Tuesday.